A very good afternoon to all. Uh, welcome to this episode of Lunchtime Devotion, uh, 6th of September. In our ongoing reading, Brother Yishu shared on uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 11 verses. And today I will share on chapter 5, verses 12 to 21. Uh, but before that, I'm going to show you the second part of the gospel project. Uh, earlier, when I first started last Monday, I shared the first part chapter 1 to 4, okay, and this is the other part that covers Romans chapter 5 to chapter 16, just to give us an overview, okay, of the book of Romans. Paul's letter to the Romans. Check out the first video where we explored who Paul was and why he wrote this letter and where we trace the core ideas of chapters 1 through 4. That all humanity is hopelessly trapped in sin and needs to be rescued. That this rescue is not going to happen by people trying to obey the laws of the Torah. Rather, God's righteous character has moved him to rescue the world through Jesus' death and resurrection so that he could create a faith-based multi-ethnic family of Abraham as his people. Now, in the remaining three movements of the letter to the Romans, Paul is going to develop these ideas even more. So, remember, Paul's exploration of justification by faith, that when people trust Jesus' death and resurrection was for them, they're given a new status, they're right with God, they're placed in a new family, the covenant people of Abraham, and they're given a new future, the hope of a transformed life. Now Paul wants to show how this reality should reshape every part of our existence because being in this family means being a part of a new humanity that God is creating through Jesus and the Spirit. So Paul goes back to the first human character of the biblical story, Adam. His name means humanity. And Adam, like all humanity after him, has chosen sin and selfishness. And so everyone faces God's judgment because we've become slaves to sin's influence resulting in death. But then Paul contrasts Adam with Jesus, who he says is the new Adam, a human who lived in faithful obedience to God, shown through his act of sacrificial love. And now Jesus offers his life as a gift to others so that they can be justified before God. And so Jesus stands as the head of a new humanity that is being transformed by this gift, which leads him to chapter 6. Paul reminds these Christians in Rome that choosing to follow Jesus means leaving their old Adam-like humanity and entering into the new Jesus-like humanity. And their baptism was a sacred symbol of that transition. Their old humanity died with Jesus and their new humanity was raised with him from the dead. So when a person trusts in Jesus, their life becomes joined to his life. What's true of him is now true of them. It's when people accept their identity as Jesus-like humans that they are liberated to become the wholehearted humans who can truly love God and their neighbor. Now, if creating this new humanity was always God's purpose, Paul asks in chapter 7, what then was the point of God giving Israel the law, or in Hebrew, the Torah? Now, side note, when Paul uses this word law, he sometimes means the storyline and message of the first five books of the Bible, but other times he's more specifically referring to the hundreds of commands given through Moses and that are found in the Torah. The second meaning is Paul's focus here. What was the purpose of all those commands? Paul says that the commands of the Torah were good. They showed God's will for how Israel was to live. But if you read the storyline of the Torah, Israel broke all those commands. The more laws Israel received, the more they replayed the sin of Adam and rebelled. So even when God gave his people specific moral rules to obey, that did not fix the problem of the sinful human heart. And so paradoxically, these rules made Israel even more guilty. But, Paul says, that paradox is the point. God's goal was to make it crystal clear that it's evil that's hijacked the human heart and that the Torah, good as it is, could not do a thing about it. But, Paul says in chapter 8, the solution has arrived in Jesus and the Spirit. And here's how. The commands of the Torah acted like a magnifying glass. It focused the problem of the human condition into one place, the people of Israel. But now Israel's representative, Jesus the Messiah, has paid for and dealt with all of that sin through his death and his resurrection. And now Jesus has released his spirit into his new family to transform their hearts so that they can truly fulfill the call of all of the Torah's commands to love God and neighbor. And there's more. 
God's renewal of human beings is the first step of his larger mission to rescue and renew all of creation, making it a place where his love gets the final word. Now you can see how chapters 1 through 8 are one long flow of thought here, but it raises some other questions. If all of this was God's purpose, what is the current status then of Paul's fellow Israelites who don't acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah? How does this story fulfill God's promises to them? Well, Paul begins in chapter 9 with his own anguish over fellow Israelites who don't think Jesus is their Messiah. And it leads him to reflect on Israel in the past from the Old Testament story. And he reminds us that simply being an ethnic Israelite, a physical descendant of Abraham, never made one automatically a faithful member of the covenant family. Paul shows us how God has always selected a subset from Abraham's family to carry on the line of promise. And his point is that now that line of promise is carried on by those who follow Jesus. He reminds us that for a long time, people inside and outside Abraham's family have rejected God's will. He reminds us of the story of Israel and the golden calf and of Pharaoh's rebellion. He shows us how God was able to orchestrate events so that people's rejection of him actually accomplished his redemptive purposes. And so in chapter 10, Paul turns his focus to Israel in the present. The reason many Israelites reject Jesus is because they're basing their covenant relationship with God on their performance of the commands in the Torah. And so sadly, they don't recognize what God has done through Jesus to create a new covenant family on the basis of faith. And so Paul asks in chapter 11, what is Israel's future? Has God written off his people? No, he says. There are tons of Jewish people, including himself, who do recognize Jesus as their Messiah, but there are also a lot who don't. But God has been able to use their rejection for his own purposes. It's caused the gospel to spread even quicker and farther into the Gentile world, making the family of Abraham even larger and more multi-ethnic. Paul describes God's covenant family as a big olive tree, and the rejectors of Jesus have been broken off, so to speak, and these Gentiles are like wild branches that have been grafted into the family tree. However, Paul says, one day Jesus will be acknowledged by his own people. He doesn't offer any details about how. Paul simply trusts God's character and promise that he won't give up on his covenant people. Which transitions into the final section of the book, chapters 12 through 16. But remember the big picture. Because of their faith in Jesus, Jews and Gentiles are now together Abraham's family, that new humanity that's being transformed by God's Spirit. And so, this is how God's fulfilling his ancient promises. Therefore, the only reasonable response is for these Jews and non-Jewish Christians to be unified as the church. In chapters 12 to 13, he shows that this unity will come from a commitment to love and forgive each other. Love will look like everybody using their diverse gifts and talents to serve one another in the church. And it will also mean humility and forgiveness. When these different ethnic groups and cultures come together in Jesus, Conflict is inevitable, and it can only be overcome through the hard work of forgiveness and reconciliation. This is how they will show the greatest of Christian virtues, love, which fulfills the Torah's greatest commands to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. In chapters 14 and 15, he focuses specifically on the issues that are creating ethnic divisions in the Roman church. These are disputes about the Jewish food laws and the Sabbath. And Paul says these practices don't define who's in or out of Jesus' family. And if people differ over these culturally important but non-essential issues, they need to learn how to respect each other's differences. And it's in this way that love will heal and unify Jesus' family. Paul closes the letter by first commending Phoebe, who's a key leader in the church of Kenkre. She had the honor of carrying and perhaps even reading this letter aloud to the Roman churches for the first time. Paul then concludes by greeting all the people that he hasn't seen for a long time, and that's the end. Whoa. You can see better now how all the pieces of this letter fit together and show what a profound masterpiece it truly is. That's what the letter to the Romans is all about. Okay, uh, Romans 5, okay, verse 12 onwards, huh? okay, so Romans 5, verse 12 says, Therefore, as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and this way death came to all men, because all sin. Okay, so we all know about Adam, and how Adam disobeyed God, 
and ate of the forbidden fruit. And because he disobeyed God and uh, sin entered the world. Okay, that's what this verse is trying to say. And because he disobeyed God, death entered the world. Death is not only a physical death, okay, that's also a result, but also a spiritual death. And the spiritual death is uh, defined as separation from God, no longer in close fellowship or communion with God. Okay, because Adam disobeyed, Eve disobeyed, sin entered the world, and with that, although they didn't physically die straight away, but there was a spiritual death, separation from God and communion with God. And verse 13 says, For before the law was given, the law was given through Moses, thousands of years after that, sin was already in the world, because with Adam and Eve disobeying, there's already sin. But sin was not taken into account where there's no law. So the law tells us thou shalt not steal. Okay. But between Adam and Moses, Adam and Moses, there was no law, but there was sin. Okay. So nevertheless, verse 14, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses when the law was given. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam was the pattern of the one. So Adam's disobedience, okay, caused sin to enter the world, and sin already in the world. So from Adam to Moses, even though there's no so-called written law, uh, okay, there was already sin, and because there was sin, okay, death resulted, a continued separation from God, and also physical death as a result of the sin. I think that's important for us to understand. Okay, so it's still prevalent as such. Verse 15 says, But the gift is not like the trespass. The gift that comes with Christ is not like the trespass, the disobedience. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, because Adam disobeyed, okay, we normally they don't talk about Eve, they talk about Adam, okay, but Adam disobeyed, many died because of the disobedience of Adam. How much more? the God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many. So what Paul is trying to say is that Adam as the one man, he sinned, he disobeyed God. And because of that, many died. All those who follow after Adam, okay, all humankind, they all died. Okay, not only physical death, but also spiritual death. But God's grace was at work. Now the same thing is a reverse. Now with Jesus coming, we paid the price, okay, by the grace of the one man, obedience of one man. Now the gift of life has appeared for all who accept Jesus. So what Adam brought into the world, uh, Jesus in the way is reversing the effect. Okay, reversing the effect. Verse 16, again, the gift of God is not at the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses. Many, many trespasses. So what Adam brought into the world, the death and sin, okay, Jesus is in the way reversing it, reversing it as such. Verse 17 says, For if by the trespass of the one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man, how much more were those who received God's abundant provision of grace, God's grace, eh? and the gift of righteousness reign in life to that one man, Jesus. So you notice that Paul is all the time contrasting Adam and Jesus. The first man, Adam. The second Adam is Jesus. And how God's grace is at work, God's righteousness is at work, God just paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. And that's important. For us to understand. Verse 18, consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, okay, everybody of sin and condemn, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. So even Jesus' grace and righteousness brought about justification. Justification, you are, co you are considered righteous before God's eye. And that gives you life, life for all men 
who trust in Jesus. Verse 19, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many will make sinners, so also, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. Again, contrasting Adam, disobedience brought condemnation, obedience of Jesus brought righteousness and truly, that is something that we need to continue, continue to talk about. Verse 20 says, the law was added so that the trespass might increase. Okay, so like I said, from Adam to Moses, they had no law, but they knew they were doing something wrong because the sinfulness to Adam was there. Okay, yesterday I preached on the whole area of conscience, God-given conscience. When they do something wrong, they know it is wrong. Okay, but with the law, when the law came, the law just added more clarity to their sin, added more clarity to what is wrong. Okay, as far as we can count, the Torah, the Old Testament laws, there's 613 laws. Okay, but a lot of times we just talk about Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments is uh, enough to keep us uh, uh, on our toes to fulfill all the, all the Ten Commandments. Okay, so, so it says that the law was added when he gave the law to Moses so that trespass might increase. Because now you are clearer what is wrong and what is right. Without the law, your conscience tells you, okay, not so clear. But once the law was given, there's greater clarity and you knew exactly what was wrong. Okay, For where sin increased, verse 20, grace increased all the more. So even as the law was given, sin increased because now you've got greater knowledge of sin but God's grace also increased God's grace also increased so that those who trust in Jesus they can receive forgiveness and the righteousness that God wants to bring okay and 21 says so that just as rain sin reign in death so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord okay so this whole Verse 12 to verse 21, we're just contrasting Adam's sin and disobedience and Jesus Christ's obedience and how it brought about righteousness and even uh, a freedom to conquer the whole area of sin and condemnation. I think that's important. Okay, so a small chart that I came across that's helpful to us. Okay, I, I, I think it be helpful. Okay, a contrast of character. Okay, the first one, uh, Adam, he brought sin into the world. Okay, Jesus, he gave people victory over sin. Huh? Okay, to Adam, many died because of his sin. Okay, and the obedience of Jesus, many live because of his grace. God's grace poured off. Adam's sin result in condemnation. Jesus' death result in justification, counted right before God. Adam's disobedience brings sin to many, okay? All the rest, mankind sin. Jesus' obedience brings righteousness to many, okay? Adam's sin results in death. But Jesus' uh, righteousness will bring victory, will bring eternal life to all who trust in him. So this one just gives a summary of all the verses that we have just read, contrasting Adam with Jesus and how Adam brought sin and death by God's plan of grace to Jesus' obedience gave us justification and righteousness and the gift of eternal life. So with that, uh, this short sharing, I hope it's helpful. Thank you.